So welcome everyone at our uh, first uh, special colloquium uh, that uh, we organize uh, for our distinguished guests and uh, members of staff. And our uh, first distinguished uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Eleonora Villa. Uh, so a few words uh, about her. So she obtained uh, both her master and PhD degrees in Milan under the supervision of uh, Professor Sa Sabino Materasse. Materasse, sorry. Then she moved to the Institute for Cosmology and the Gravitation in Portsmouth, uh, UK. <clears throat> and after this, uh, to International School for Advanced Studies in Trieste. And finally, she joined uh, uh, our institute and she works in the group of Professor Kozinski. Uh, ex her expertise is in standard cosmological perturbation theory and analytic techniques that are used for description of nonlinear relativistic, relativistic structure formation. And I believe her talk will be about this, as the title is Relativistic Perturbation Theory in Cosmology Beyond the Linear Regime. Please. Okay, thank you, Adam. Yes, so my talk would be uh, about relativistic perturbation theory, of course, and the topic is huge, so I have chosen uh, to focus on some aspects. Uh, so this is my outline. Um, I will give a rather theoretical introduction to cosmological perturbation theory, focusing on uh, the gauge issue and some ways to, let's say, solve it. Uh, and then I will uh, tell you about uh, the theoretical framework that we use in cosmology to define uh, observables. And I will conclude by presenting uh, the latest result um, regarding uh, the evolution of relativistic um, perturbations uh, beyond um, linear theory. So, very, very, very briefly, um, our, we think that uh, a very good model for our universe is um, the homogeneous and isotropic FRW background plus perturbations. And uh, our goal is uh, characterize um, the evolution of uh, the perturbations, for example, phi, which uh, stays for the gravitational potential. Uh, we imagine that the evolution is uh, split into three parts. The first one is the primordial part, uh, which is set uh, during inflation. The second is encoded in the transfer function, uh, which describes the very complicated um, interactions between uh, the standard matter and uh, photons during uh, the, what we call uh, the radiation era and the early stages of the matter era. And the last phase, um, which uh, here I call the growth function, um, is uh, about the evolution uh, when um, the photons and the matter decouple. Uh, which is driven by uh, the matter uh, at the beginning and the matter plus uh, the cosmological constant um, um, at later times. Yeah, yeah, that's the quantum um, fluctuations uh, during inflation. During inflation, yeah. No, I am not an expert uh, on inflationary physics. Is it given either from the God or of whatever process you... you yeah, you whatever. Work? It's bogus. It, it's on a hypothetical uh, inflation part. So we assume there's a primordial fluctuations and given this... We, we also assume physics. inflation. <laughs> we have uh, a lot of model for inflations. This is more or less all I know about inflation. No, I'm joking. But yeah, okay. Uh, I will focus on the very last phase during the, the talk. So, uh, the approximation that we use to, uh, mm, to achieve such a difficult task uh, is a relativistic perturbation theory, which is basically an expansion uh, around our homogeneous and isotropic uh, FRW background. 
Uh, so this um, theory is valid only uh, where and when uh, the fluctuations um, in the matter density and in all other fields are small. Uh, so this means in cosmology that uh, relativistic perturbation theory is valid on very large scales at uh, early times. And uh, this description is fully relativistic, in a sense that we are really using GR. Uh, okay, so this is a spoiler. <laughs> uh, so the statement is that, and I will um, show you later why and how, but the thing is that uh, in, in general relativity, cosmological perturbations depend on the coordinate system that we used. So, a lot of questions arise from this statement. First is, are there mm, choices which are better than other? And in case, why? Can we avoid that? Because it's annoying uh, for, from a, a theoretical point of view. Also, uh, if we want to link uh, what we can calculate with and body simulation to our framework, which is relativistic, you, you have to build a dictionary between coordinates used uh, in the Newtonian embody simulation and the coordinate in which you perform your calculation in GR. And last but not least, uh, is that important for what we ob observe? So I will try to answer to all these questions. And I will begin by uh, introducing uh, what is called the gauge freedom or uh, diffeomorphism invariance of general relativity uh, with a very uh, theoretical and geometrical perspective. Uh, my reference is the book by um, Bob Wald. Um, and this um, point of view about uh, diffeomorphism invariance and the gauge issue, issue of perturbation theory goes back to my <laughs> early studies. So I hope you will appreciate this um, very theoretical point of view. So, manifolds. Uh, suppose we have two manifolds and that, uh, that uh, we can build um, a map between uh, uh, these two manifolds. Also, consider a scalar field, uh, which can represent anything in physics, um, uh, defined on uh, one ma manifold uh, and assume uh, a number as a value. Uh, so if you have uh, a map between the two manifolds, you can uh, pull back your scalar fields uh, defined on one manifold to the other. That's very simple. You, you mean uh, one to one and on to. Yeah, that's if <laughs> the map. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> so if. Uh, your uh, map is one to one and on to, it's called a diffeomorphism, which means that you can go back and forth from uh, between uh, the two uh, manifolds, and you can do uh, the same uh, with uh, any tensor field defined either or on M or on N. So uh, you can we say that you can push forward and pull back any tensor uh, fields defined on both manifolds. Isn't the first thing you can do different from the one where you have one manifold and you use different coordinates? No, it's not. I can skip uh, 20 minutes of my talk then. <laughs> no, it's not. They are perfectly equivalent. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Because you can write uh, the diffeomorphism in terms of coordinates. So the diffeomorphism, the fact is that the diffeomorphism really maps coordinates. So the two descriptions are perfectly yeah, equivalent. OK. Um, so um, if 
uh, we can, uh, if we have this very special map, then the two manifolds have um, an identical structure. And this means that uh, we can uh, describe nature in terms of tensor field on one manifold or tensor field in the other. Um, and we are free to choose any representation. So this is called uh, the gauge freedom of general relativity or diffeomorphism invariance of uh, general relativity as a theory. Okay. So, um, so the gauge freedom uh, has uh, two uh, approaches, let's say. So one deals with uh, two different manifolds and two different, well, different, two collections of uh, tensor fields. So if we describe nature by means of one manifold and a collection of tensor fields that define on that manifold, we can use this special map called diffeomorphism to construct an entirely new manifold and new tensor fields. And any physical meani uh, meaningful statement about the one collection will hold for the second collection uh, because of the properties of uh, this map. And the two descriptions are equivalent. The uh, passive approach instead uh, deals with uh, coordinates. So imagine that uh, we have two coordinate system, one of the f on the first manifold and the other on the second. As I said, we can use the diffeomorphism uh, between the two manifolds to construct a new coordinate system on the first manifold by simply pulling back uh, the coordinate on the second manifold. So in this uh, view, uh, the effect of, of the map is just uh, equal to that of a standard coordinate transformation. So it changes components and bases, leaving tensor unchanged. So we can also use the same manifold and the same uh, tensors, but with different uh, components. So uh, these two descriptions using um, different coordinates are equivalent and are also equivalent to uh, the description uh, which use uses two manifolds and two collections of, um, of tensor fields. Okay, so uh, I briefly summarize uh, diffeomorphism invariance of general relativity, which in practice allows uh, us to use any coordinate system we want to describe nature uh, at best we can do, but what this has to do with perturbation theory. Uh, so actually this is very important uh, in perturbation theory because um, we split um, any tensor field in a background part plus perturbation. And the thing is that uh, th these two parts live in different manifolds. So the background part is defined on the background spacetime. And the perturbation and the full tensor is defined on the perturbed spacetime. So, as said, we have the freedom to choose uh, a diffeomorphism with between uh, these two space times, or equivalently, we have the freedom uh, to choose different coordinate systems on the uh, physical space time, which is the, the true, let's say, uh, space time that we have because the background is just a known solution which is. Uh, not representing reality anymore once you allow uh, perturbations. Okay, so uh, this is in a, yeah. To, to change, is it possible to change a coordinate system in a such a way that perturbation vanishes? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Globally, no, you cannot do it in GR. But you can choose uh, gauges in which some perturbations. Way that uh, 
so I have this, uh, I split my tensor into two parts, mm -hmm. two parts and then I change uh, the coordinate system uh, in a such a way that this uh, uh, addition actually vanishes globally everywhere because I, why is it not possible? Because you have, well, you have different uh, quantities. You, you cannot make perturbations of everything because vanishes. Of a very you have tensor, you have all these four functions. Mm -hmm. you the exactly. Four. You have six degrees of freedom physically in your metric okay. and four okay, 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 okay. in the okay. coordinate transformation. So you cannot do it. Yeah, you can make vanishing some perturbation of the metric with the coordinate, but not uh, not all. It just finished. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the investigation um, about the gauge issue in uh, cosmological perturbation theory goes back to the 90s, and I give here these two references um, because uh, the treatment there is geometrical and 100% clear. So I studied um, this thing um, on these two papers, actually. And I think that it's the best way to present the problem, like geometry <laughs> um, with uh, proofs, and uh, it's. Well, the the parameters. Yeah, the the density contrast is not. Well, the density contrast is a quantity which is uh, small. It's not the, the parameter itself, I would say. Just the you, you just put a parameter instead of something that you assume that, it, that is a small. Yeah, density or uh, perturbation in the metric. Now, it's the density perturbation on uh, a uniform uh, distribution. This is uh, our mm, one of the, mm, the quantities that we assume that are small. Okay. Oh, yeah, for example, density or potential or whatever. No, density also is also is also gauge dependent. Physical density is not. <laughs> In perturbation theory, it is. what we call the background and the perturbation. Mm -hmm. And the same procedure, the same situation, occurs in the old ancient theory in mathematical physics, which is called the theory of elasticity, where uh, we also split the tensor quantities, for example, the metric tensor deformation, into an uh, anterpurbate part, the background part, and what really comes from the perturbation. And people there, they are building houses, so they know that the perturbation depends on the choice of a coordinate. And in order to avoid the problems, they have invented a certain conditions 
which guarantee that whatever you calculate that in whatever coordinate system has the same physical objective information. And elasticity theory, they are called the sum venom conditions. And uh, in geometry, that means that the normal elasticity theory works in a, in a space, in the three-dimensional space for which the Riemann tensor is equal to zero. And they didn't know the Riemann tensor, so they invented the complicated. So shouldn't something like this exist here, which will make this choice of the per coordinate system in some sense irrelevant? I don't know whether you can call it the Cajun variant. Not to our knowledge, actually. Houses are not expanding, nor they have two point observers. They have such Yes, you have Bardeen variables. Uh, you can solve uh, Einstein's equation at first order. You cannot at second, for example. And what about the real challenge, observables? Are they gauge invariant? Are they? They are not. You can build a gauge invariant. Uh, yeah, sure. But then you have also to solve for. Some 30 years ago or something like that, my crew made uh, Mirek Panek wrote a paper uh, about gauge independent observables in relativistic perturbation theory. Mm. And uh, I think with Marek Demiański. And uh, is it still considered uh, useful or then it just uh, has been forgotten basically? Well, uh, the, the thing. Uh, this particular paper of Mirek, uh, because he moved them to, to finances and, and uh, is not more active in the field. And just for curiosity, I'm asking this question. No. Okay. A concept. Okay, so um, as said, um, the problem in, well, the gauge issue arises in perturbation theory uh, because uh, we have two different uh, space time. One is representing the background, and the other is representing the, the, the real space time when we have the background plus perturbation. Uh, the perturbation on, of a tensor is obviously defined as the difference uh, between uh, the tensor in the physical space-time and the tensor in the background. Uh, and this means that the very definition of the perturbation depends on the map between these two uh, space-time, which we call a gauge choice. Uh, so, as a consequence, a gauge transformation is a change uh, in this map and uh, it will change uh, the perturbation. So, this is very simple. So, uh, in cosmology, again, we have one background uh, which is given by uh, the FRW uh, space-time and we expand uh, both the manifold and the collection of, of tensor field that we use, for example, to simplify things, uh, just the metric tensor, in, Taylor, uh, in a Taylor, Taylor series. Uh, for example, um, we can stop at uh, second order, and <laughs> I can assure it's, it's already uh, <laughs> enough. So we have one description, uh, in terms of uh, one collection, uh, one manifold and one 
uh, metric tensor and another equivalent uh, description in terms of another manifold and uh, another mm, metric tensor. And we can also uh, define at any order uh, gauge transformations uh, between uh, the two um, descriptions. Uh, so now I will uh, describe how you can obtain uh, the rules for gauge transforming uh, uh, all the tensor fields that you, uh, that you have on your uh, manifold up to second order. And again, uh, these results uh, go back to 1997. So it's rather recent I in cosmology. <laughs> okay, so um, let's say uh, there are two um, equivalent descriptions, an active approach in which you uh, write down uh, the, the curve itself, uh, which represents the diffeomorphism that connect, connects uh, the two manifold, and the passive approach in which you uh, Taylor expand the uh, coordinate uh, transformation and then you transform uh, tensors accordingly uh, to the rules uh, that we know that follows from the diffeomorphism invariance of the value of the tensor fields and this is like in one uh, sentence without formulas. So uh, the thing is that uh, when you expand at second order, uh, you have to be very careful uh, because uh, there are mm, expansions hidden in the first order um, terms. For example, if you um, this is the expansion of uh, the, the diffeomorphism, you have to be careful because you change. Uh, you, you map two different points and you want that your map is defined from one point to the other. So in practice, uh, you have to change uh, the first order term when you do this. And so uh, starting from uh, this map, uh, you end up uh, with this. So the, the thing is very sub subtle, you have a plus. You start it from a minus and you find a plus. <laughs> but this is, uh, this is, I mean, it's correct. And uh, these kind of things happen when you, when you play uh, with the details of Taylor expansions, let's say. OK, so uh, we know that uh, you can uh, equivalently uh, define a coordinate transformation which will have the same form I showed before, I mean this one. And uh, we can uh, now uh, transform tensors um, simply applying, uh, applying the, the rule uh, that we know. For example, for one form uh, you transform one forms using uh, the Jacobian. The only thing is that you have to expand both the Jacobian and let's say the point in which uh, the original one form is calculated around the uh, curve representing the diffeomorphism or equivalently uh, around the, um, the coordinate tra transformation. So it's long but straightforward. So I will just show the results. Okay, it's here. Yeah. So uh, for one forms, uh, you end up with this uh, formula involving uh, the lead derivative uh, along the infinitesimal uh, coordinate transformations, and for vectors, you have this formula. And here I recall. Uh, the, the, the definition of the lead derivatives um, for vectors. And for the metric, well, the formula is longer. Yes, it's, uh, it's here. Yeah, it's the lead derivative of the lead derivative. Yeah. 
Yes. Okay, and this quite long uh, formula is uh, the, the formula uh, for, um, to transform the metric tensor between one gauge and, and another at second order in perturbation theory. Okay, so now there is another, the last step. Yes, yes. The reason is that um, our instruments, in Cosmo our telescopes nowadays are very precise and we want to make prediction for higher order statistics, for example, in galaxy clustering, and you need second order to do that. Also, there are already observables, uh, for example, or effects, let's say, the lensing of the CMB, or the lensing in general, uh, I'm talking about the lensing of the CMB because uh, the, the observation is older, uh, cannot, is for sure there is not enough to describe lensing or to describe something which complicated as the bispectrum. Uh, so we need higher order statistics uh, also mm, to measure, to distinguish between inflationary models, measure non-Gaussianities, so we need this. That's why we are dealing with second order stuff. Okay, yes, yeah. In in, yes, yes. In a sense that there are out there, there are effects that cannot be described only with linear theory. Small, but we, we claim that we can measure it in the, the near future. Well, the linear theory was too easy. <laughs> I started with studied second order stuff. So <laughs> it will get more, uh, more simple later. I just wanted to, to give this geometrical introduction because I like it. And I started actually my master studying this stuff. So I apologize. I will try to, to summarize. Eh? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, so the, the let's skip. Well, no, I will not skip the very last uh, step. Uh, so um, this formula here transforms um, a tensor which is not expanded. It just transforms a tensor on. Um, according to an expanded coordinate transformation. So we have perturbation, so the original tensor is expanded. So we have, we can write the, 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 the Taylor expansion like that in the two gauges, then apply the transformation to every uh, term of our Taylor expansion. And finally, this is the rule uh, according to which perturbations um, transform. So the background doesn't transform, of course, and first order perturbation transform like this, and the second order perturbation transforms like this. So I think I'm done with this part. Yes. <laughs> okay. So uh, perturbations depend on the uh, on the gauge. We know how to transform things between two gauges, even in the complicated second order mm, or second order. So uh, 
the, the natural question is, okay, which gauge we should use? Well, my answer is that it depends. Uh, my references are basically one uh, lecture uh, given at the Les uh, Summer School in back in 95, which is quite old but still very clear, and it's restricted to first order PT. And the second is, let's say, the upgrade <laughs> by Karim Malik and David Wons, uh, which goes to uh, second order, and it's a physical report. So both these references are very uh, clear regarding the question which gauge should be used. So, uh, a common sense choice uh, would be to use gauges uh, which have a clear interpretation, at least in a Newtonian dynamics. I hope you agree on that. So we know that to describe, for example, fluid dynamics, we can use Lagrangian and Eulerian uh, pictures. And in GR, uh, the Lagrangian picture uh, translates into what we call the synchronous co-moving gauge, uh, which has this um, form for uh, the line element. But let's say physically, in this gauge, uh, spatial coordinates are constant along the matter, so the, mat the for velocity of the matter is vanishing, and the time coordinate is precisely the proper time of the matter. So you can see that uh, this description is, well, the extension of the Lagrangian picture uh, in GR, uh, the Newtonian Lagrangian picture in GR. Um, and, um, you can prove it by taking the Einstein equations in this gauge, uh, by taking uh, the Newtonian limit, and by verifying that the Newtonian limit of the Einstein equations in this gauge coincides with uh, the mm, um, Newtonian equation for the dynamics in the Lagrangian formulation. The second choice uh, of gauges with, with a clear correspondence to Newtonian theory uh, is uh, the, what we call the Poisson gauge, which extends to GR, uh, the Eulerian picture. Uh, this is the line element. Uh, we have um, perturbation also in the time-time component of the metric and in the space-time component. These are the conditions uh, on the degrees of freedom on this gauge. And again, uh, you can prove that this corresponds to the Eulerian picture in Newtonian physics uh, by taking the, Einstein, the Newtonian limit of Einstein's equations, and you will find um, the Newtonian equation for the dynamics in the Eulerian formulation. So these two gauges are for obvious reasons, uh, very, very popular and quite old. I mean, th this making this choice was is back to, again, the 90s when we uh, started to study uh, perturbation theory in cosmology, like, seriously. Uh, a third choice, uh, it's recent, very recent, and uh, it's driven by uh, the aim to push uh, evolution to the nonlinear regime with, let's say, a trick. So, uh, as I said, uh, the we imagine that the evolution of perturbation is split in three parts. Uh, so the trick is uh, to use cosmological perturbation theory for the two parts, which, are, mm, which uh, regard uh, early times, and uh, Newtonian and body simulation for the uh, last part, uh, which involved um, later times. And the standard approach to make this trick work, actually work, uh, is to use initial condition from GR uh, that describes this part of the evolution. And then, starting from, from initial condition uh, from GR, 
run an embody simulation. So to describe the nonlinear part of the evolution. OK, so this is not perfect because in a s in the, the fact is that you lose the relativist, you lose GR, the GR signature in the evolution. It's maybe it's a problem, maybe not. We, are, we don't know or yet uh, what the question is. But anyway, this is the standard uh, approach. So you, to do this, uh, you have to construct a, a dictionary linear to begin with between GR and, and body simulation. So uh, yeah. I'm coming from modified gravity, so you might wonder, uh, you might, might not be surprised this question, why did you skip Jordan frame, which is m very convenient when you try to describe per, uh, scalar fields perturbation? Uh, it's, not, it's not convenient for the general perturbation no. theory no, at no, all, no, because you have the, the richy scalar... Uh, I know, I know what jo the Jordan frame I know is. what you know, but, but uh, I know it's not that you know. No, it's not uh, um, a good choice, good. I would say. We okay. are driven to, okay, what the link between uh, Newtonian, f um, with Newtonian physics, something physical. Because you want to take Newtonian so limit the Jordan to frame is a, a convenient frame to write down some equation, but in the end uh, you have to go back uh, and... Uh, From that we, point of yeah, view. Yeah, we, we, we try to, to solve Einstein equation, Einstein's equation in, in the gauges that we prefer. Okay, thanks. I've never read mm, cosmological perturbation theory like GR in the Jordan frame. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but it's also is is not useful, right? In the end. <laughs> okay, so in order to do this, again, um, we have to construct a dictionary between the coordinates that we use in GR and the coordinates that are used in uh, uh, the body simulation. So this, uh, this is the motivation for uh, the third choice for the gauge I'm presenting uh, today. Uh, it's called the N-body gauge. And uh, it is built uh, in such a way that the quantity, which is the fundamental quantity of N-body simulation, which is the displacement uh, in the trajectory from Initial, the initial position is the same in GR and in, Newton, um, in Newtonian physics. So um, this is uh, the linear version of the gauge. This is the line element. Uh, three degrees of freedom are fixed by putting the peculiar velocity in the space-time, um, the time-space perturbation. And the other is fixed by comparing <laughs> the Newtonian uh, equations and make uh, the Einstein's equation look the same. So you find that you have to impose uh, this condition on the uh, perturbation of the trace of the space-space um, component. So this is, to my opinion, a very smart uh, uh, way of thinking to, to fix a gauge, which is meaningful. Sorry. Capital H is the perturbation of the trace of the space space component of the metric. It's here. Sorry? Well, delta is the density contrast. This is the Poisson equation. Okay. So this choice uh, go back to 2015, so I'd say it's very recent. Uh, and there is a uh, work in progress about uh, this uh, gauge. So the first uh, uh, formulation is for linear perturbation and no pressure, but you cannot use it for Boltzmann code um, about uh, you know, the coupling between photons and, and uh, cold dark matter. So the first update was done in 2016 and includes radiation. And the third, uh, in 2017, uh, is about, uh, let's say, uh, a new and more powerful uh, approximation scheme that goes beyond uh, perturbation theory and 
Uh, it's for mm, describing nonlinear evolution, but I will completely skip uh, this argument. Th the message here uh, is that uh, this gauge is smart, and there is still uh, work in progress on it. Gauge in, uh, allows you also to solve for uh, uh, neutrinos or relativistic species or just no, photos? They, I, I think that they still have to do it. Okay. I will be too good to be true, right? N for the no, moment. but they are working on that. Uh, I, I talked to Christian recently and he said, okay, we should yeah, <laughs> put neutrinos. Okay. Another solution uh, would be uh, to uh, formulate perturbation theory in a form which is valid in any gauge. So you just read off expressions that are valid, whatever coordinates you want to use. And this is called the gauge invariant formulation of uh, perturbation theory. And uh, it goes back to the 80s with this very important paper by uh, Bardeen. And I um, refer here again to the very clear, like textbook clear, uh, physical report by uh, Karim Malik and David Wons uh, about the, the, the gauge invariant formulation. So what do you have to do to build gauge invariant variables? First, take your line element. Well, assume that the space-time admits uh, a 3 plus 1 split, to be fair. Uh, in full generality, you can decompose your line element uh, this way, with all the 10 degrees of freedom in the metric, which are 6 physical and 4 mm, are the exactly the coordinate choice that you make, in uh, uh, scalars, vectors, and tensors. Uh, so you do this to the metric tensor. Then you decompose also the gauge transformation itself, and you decompose, finally, the transformation rule for the metric. So you have to split everything in scalar vectors and tensors, and you obtain this in the end, uh, which are, so these are the um, trans uh, gauge transformation rules up to second order for uh, the metric tensor. The reference here is my paper with um, Cornelius Ranf, who was, uh, we met at the ICG, he was a postdoc there, like me. Now is uh, Marie Curie Fellow in, uh, in Nice. And I give uh, my paper as a reference because we corrected some typos um, in the previous literature about these uh, formulas. So you end up with these formulas. Then uh, you do what? So let's keep, let's uh, look at first order, which is more, far more simple. So you know the, the transformation rules, so you can uh, find the combination that do not transform. And this, uh, for example, this combination uh, of uh, variable, which is a mix um, between, no, it's, yeah, it's a mix between uh, uh, the scalars, um, the scalar perturbation of the metric. So this combination uh, looks the same in the two gauges, and it's just one. You need uh, six, and it's possible to, to build them. It's not, well, for so that it is. No. No, 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 no. This is just the first. It is possible to, to build also um, gauge invariant perturbation at second order. It was done. Uh, and I think they are, uh, yeah, no, I think. I know that they are in this uh, physical report uh, I was mentioning before. But uh, to solve Einstein equation for them, it's, uh, well, not already done, let's say. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's far more difficult. Try it's, it's really difficult. Uh, I mean, this is first order. <laughs> And this is the most simple that you can write down for scalars. So, 
Okay, so you, again, write Einstein's equation in terms of this. You are looking at something that is valid on any gauge. And, uh, okay, this is a way to go, let's say. And it was studied, it was investigated, this gauge invariant formulation, a lot during the 80s and the 90s. Because from the theoretical point of view, it's tempting to have something which looks the same in any gauge, given this problem. But... Uh, you have uh, four degrees of freedom of the metric plus the gauge transformation itself because yes the standard 10 you, have, you start with 10 you will end up with 10 Only combinations are... No, I don't... Yes. 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 Tag. You have... You, you, ten. You j it's just a change of variables, I mean. You have ten in... Uh, no, 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 no. They are 10 because to write down gauge invariant variables, you need the four function, the information contained in the four functions of the coordinate transformations. So you have 10. Well, this is one uh, variable, which is, I agree, which is gauge invariant. Okay, but you... The linearized, yes, it, it's, yes, it's gauge invariant. Well, it's just one variables and variable and uh, the link between, it contains derivatives. Um, if you express the curvature in terms of... Maybe it was done, I don't know. Uh, okay, but the real question is, given that cosmological perturbations depend on the gauge, is this really important? And by really, I mean for our theoretical predictions for the observables, which are the final challenge for a theorist to predict what we measure is what we, I mean, we all do. So when we write down uh, our uh, modeling for the observables, is that expression gauge dependent? Uh, and, uh, well, the two papers uh, I know that uh, treat this complicated issue uh, is uh, the, the first is from uh, 1999, uh, and it's formulated in the very geometrical 
point of view, so it's sort of difficult to read and not very recent. Uh, and the second paper uh, is by Jayul Yo and Ruth Durer, and Jayul is the expert of uh, gauge invariant formulation of perturbation theory is in in uh, in GR. Uh, and well, if you if you I will present this uh, topic according to this um, second reference and try to be clear enough. Okay, so uh, I think we... Five minute break? Oh, okay. Ten minutes? Okay, that's fine. 